You're watching Face to Face and I'm your host, Tim Vince. I'm delighted to be joined by Ruth Broomhall, author and educator. You, Welcome, Tim. Ruth. Thank you. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about some great historic characters who, who you know something about. And, uh, uh, and our theme is being called by God. But before we do, Ruth, your Christian journey, where did it start? And how, is, how have you got to be writing about such epic characters? Where did it start? Well, a very Christian home, um, a very faithful upbringing. Um, and I would say, looking back, perhaps wasn't aware of it at the time, I became a Christian at the age of five. I still remember going into my bedroom and kneeling down by my bed and reading from a book and I think that was the time when I look back that I gave my life to Christ. Um, hasn't been a smooth journey. I went away from it for quite a long time. Didn't feel I could live up to what was required. Um, but I don't think the, if it's in you, it never leaves you. If the spirit's there, it never leaves you. And um, the journey back has not been easy. Um, I can identify with much of Bunyan's journey mm -hmm. in the Pilgrim's Progress and his own. Yeah. Um, and that's a reassurance at the time when I started reading um, and engaging more deeply with Bunyan's writing. That was a real reassurance to me that um, this is perhaps how God works, especially yeah. when you've been off the road. Yeah. <laughs> Coming back in, there's a phrase in Bunyan's um, book, Pilgrim's Progress, that says, it's easier, it, it's harder to come back than it is to leave. Yeah. And, um, and I would say that's very true. Yeah. And, um, but it's been a very rich journey, I would say, since I started my journey back to faith. Mm. And actually I would, um, in many ways, say that my work as an educator, as a teacher, teaching the Pilgrim's Progress in schools, and in holiday clubs, etc., and visiting Bunyan Meeting, which is Bunyan's church, yeah. with a school, and then deciding that was one church I'd not tried in Bedford, yeah. so I would try that. Yeah. And it was the the church and the ministry there that I think really helped me on my journey. Yeah. Back so, to so Ruth, we've dropped a few hints. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, well, on John Bunyan, which yep. is great, and I, I remember we about five years ago. You, you had set up, I think, a series of Lent talks yes. on John Bunyan. Yes. And so I was invited. Was it only five years ago? It must have been 2017. 20, that's amazing. I was trying to work out on the way here yeah. when it was. It would have been, I think it was the year after, the Easter after the devotional To Be a Pilgrim was published, yeah. which I co-authored with Peter Morden, yeah. who was my supervisor when I went to Spurgeon's College to do my master's. Yeah. And I think it was on the basis of that that we decided to do the Lent services for the churches together yep. based on the Pilgrim's Progress. And you were the first speaker. Oh, I didn't know that either. You were number one. Well, I do remember uh, going in and suddenly realising, wow, there's a wide group of people here, uh, yes. including tourists, because it's a great yes. tourist centre. Yes. And it wasn't that difficult, to be honest, because the windows were filled with images of Pilgrim's I know, Progress. They're stunning, aren't so they? I was able to, I didn't have to be a sort of fanatical evangelical to give the gospel, no. if you know what I mean. It was and all there for Absolutely, me. and that's what's so amazing about his book, that yeah. it is inclusive. Yeah. And I've taught it to, you know, schools, multicultural schools, children of all faiths or none. Yeah. And you can teach it because it's a journey that everyone experiences, the journey of life. Yeah but it's also overtly Christian. Yeah. And it's amazing from that point of view. And it's part of our heritage as a nation, yes. which yes. should give you that crossover yeah. to a, the whole secular education system to say, oh, this is an important is. element of history. our history. And it's still the third most published book in the world. That's amazing. Um, it was the second for many, many years, but Harry Potter has uh, oh, really? How it funny. to the post. Well, Harry Potter is quite recent. So the point yes. about Pilgrim's Progress, I think I'm right in saying, and I haven't watched Desert Island Discs for years, but I'm sure it's still good. But they, they would often say, well, you have the, the complete works of Shakespeare, the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress. They don't have that anymore. Because oh. I, I now listen to um, Desert Island Discs yep. occasionally when yep. it's on. 
No, it's the complete works of Shakespeare in the Bible. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. So. But I don't know if you watched any of the documentaries to do with the Queen after yeah, yes. she had oh, passed absolutely. away. And I remember I'd come back from holiday and I just walked in the door and my mum was watching one of the documentaries and it actually ended with a quote from a passage from part two of the Pilgrim's Progress. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and what, Still relevant. So what you did as an educator is you put it into a course. Is it yes. for religi religious uh, studies or religious no, education no. classes? How did you I would say it's mainly target? mainly targeted for primary schools. My, my absolute hope <laughs> would be that one day it's in every primary school mm -hmm. in the UK. Um, and, and you've got a wall chart that literally yes. shows the whole storyline. The journey, yes. Using, um, using the images of the windows at Bunyan yeah. Meeting with their permission and some key quotes, some key, key verses and the timeline. So it's, it's a visual of the journey. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Great. Yes. So, you know, I would say that um, John Bunyan was called of God. And, he was, But so you, have, you have written another... Yes. Um, quite, uh, quite an epic book of, on quite yes. a, another epic um, yep. historical character. And I, I'd like to talk more about James Hudson Taylor Good. and your family connection. Yes. Tell, tell, me, uh, tell me about that first and then we'll talk about the book. Okay, so family connection is Hudson Taylor um, had a sister called Amelia and Amelia is my great grandmother. Okay. She was married, she married Benjamin Broomhall and... Um, had an awful lot to do with the CIM as yeah. well as Hudson Taylor, okay, so, so they were the support on the ground. For the benefit of people that don't know much about Christian history or recent missionary yeah. history, uh, Hudson Taylor founded the uh, China Inland Mission. Yes. Um, uh, really, he was a sort of pioneer of founding of m missionary societies. He was born in the 1830s. So, yes. So yeah. he was sort of up and running in the mid-Victorian era. He was, yes. Amazing. He wasn't the first missionary to China by any means. There were others. Okay. Um, there was another missionary to China who dressed as a Chinese, but that mission society didn't, didn't really succeed. And when Hudson Taylor went, he felt called to China from the age of 17. He didn't know until seven years later that his parents had committed his life, even before birth, to China. And when he left, I think he felt he would never come home because obviously the trip to China in those days, six months on a boat, he didn't think he would return. Mm -hmm. But neither did he think he was going to be the leader of a mission. He just went to tell the Chinese about Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I was, um, we were both at the, um, the funeral of our dear friend, uh, Gillian Orpin. Okay. And um, I spoke at the funeral and I mentioned, oh, and we have, you know, members of the Broomhall family here. I think your mother your I mother wasn't was there. there. I couldn't make it, but my mum was there. Um, yes. And there were, because uh, Gillian was, was a missionary with OMF, yes. who, who were the inheritors of um, um, CIM, I think they changed the name That's after right. yes. the Cultural Revolution. Um, I think there were some, you know, national directors there. And, yes. and they they immediately wanted to find out where is, um, where is Mrs. Broomhall? Right, okay. Because of the history yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, although you've written a book about JHT, James Hudson Taylor, you know, the, the story was also the Broomhall story and how, yeah. how the mission was, yes. was kept going. And it was, it was actually a very personal journey as I was writing it. Mm. And not through any planning, I had 10 weeks to write the book in <laughs> from start to finish. So I had to kind of get into a rhythm. And what happened, not through planning, but it sort of became this way, was that I used Hudson Taylor's own autobiography, which is yeah. very small. Yeah. Then his son and daughter-in-law's volumes on his life. Yeah. So they lived and worked very closely with him. His nephew, his great nephew, and then me. Yeah. So. In a sense, it's, it's using mainly writing about his life and his work from the family, yeah. but obviously using secondary sources too, just to make sure there was some objectivity to the writing. So, so he um, went sort of mid-19th century to China. He did, yes. And 
and gr the the mission grew into every province of, yeah. of China. So he, it, what's interesting, and I think when I was younger, I I was told about him, and I saw him as a missionary that simply went to China and told the Chinese about Christ, wore Chinese dress, and was able to evangelize the whole of China. In actually reading more detail about his life, what really impressed me was, yes, he did all of that, but it wasn't an easy journey. He didn't expect to be the leader. That came later, after coming back to England thinking he might never go back to China because of ill health, because of the situation there. Um, but he was somebody who spread the word, but he also did it not just through talking, but through deed. Mm. So he trained to be a doctor, he trained to be a midwife. He read up on being a sailor because he knew he was on a six month voyage. He was a linguist, he taught himself Chinese, he knew Hebrew from the age of four. Wow. Um, he was an architect and a builder. He helped build the hospital at Chifu and source the timber from um, shipwrecks to build it. I mean, he was just, to he me... He was a polymath, an yeah, amazing character. Yes, and he wasn't somebody that just spoke the word. Yeah. He did it, he lived it. Yeah. And he must have had amazing organisation skills as well. Yes, to, to have he was a strategist. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's there was a word, or a phrase rather, called mission intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that's something that, you know, we all should apply. Yeah. He, he didn't just know what he wanted to do, he learned what he needed to know about China. He studied China and he also distributed his knowledge on China with the books that he wrote, China's Spiritual Needs and Claims, China's Millions. And, and yes, he was a strategist. He had a strategy for the mission. Yeah. And so when he knew he was called and when he was going, it says he took a eminently practical turn. Amazing. So he planned it. Yeah, amazing. I, yeah. I, I was over in the States traveling around and I wanted to go to the, um, the Ark Museum and, and the Ark Museum is in Kentucky and it, it, it um, describes all the history of, you know, of mission and there was a, a, a room dedicated to Hudson Taylor there. And That's I amazing, thought, I didn't know that. Was, no, I thought I'd want to have at least one thing you didn't know. No, I didn't um, know that. And no, so they, that. they literally had bought some of the memorabilia, yeah. even his own original chair and they put it That's they, incredible. within but you I showed you the pictures and you yes. weren't quite sure where which home it no. was because he had a few he would there. have had a few so his first married home was in Ningpo just south of Shanghai but they also had if you like I suppose the best word for it is a compound so it could have been in that compound which was not Ningpo yeah um, but yeah just seeing that recreated yeah is, so it's it's yeah. special when we think of China today and we think that yeah. there's still embedded within China a large number of Christians who yes. trace their spiritual heritage back to yes. Hudson Taylor. Yeah, but also there's a connection with Bunyan too, which okay. is oh, exciting, that, I think. That, oh, it is for me because they're the two themes of today. Yeah, absolutely. And you find this, I think, that there's so many connections in Christian history. God works in patterns yeah. and connections. Yeah. So. Hudson Taylor grew up with the Pilgrim's Progress, which was quite typical in those days. But then when he was in China, he had, as a spiritual friend, they were only really working together for about seven months. But William Burns mm. was the man that translated the Pilgrim's Progress into the Chinese language. Amazing. And then the Pilgrim's Progress became one of the books that missionaries going to China with the CIM had to study and no in Chinese. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, okay, let's tell, let's talk a little more about the Broom Halls. Okay. Um, and you know what? What actually Benjamin Broom Hall, your ancestor? What? Yes. What? Um, what? What contribution did he make to the story right. alongside Hudson Taylor and sure. following? So, before we talk about Benjamin, Amelia yeah. was very close to his to her brother. Yeah. They had a very tight bond. And a lot of the history that we know is because they wrote letters to each other, long letters that exist. Mm. So you, you, know, you can learn the history through those. Yeah. Um, she then married Benjamin, who was a friend of Hudson Taylor's. And I believe they married while Hudson Taylor was in his first six years out in China. 
I think Amelia and Benjamin had hoped to join Hudson Taylor in China, and Hudson yeah. Taylor had hoped the same thing, but it never worked out. But what they did do was do a lot of um, work back in England to front. support yeah. Hudson Taylor. So very practically, their home became a home for his children at times when they came back to England, really for their own health and safety, and to enable Hudson and his second wife, Jenny, to yeah. really focus on the mission work. Yeah, just let's break in there because there is a story of tragedy as well. So, oh, yes, and hugely. Maybe we should just talk about that. Okay. Because I remember seeing a biography that, that basically said it, in the list uh, of, of the, the life experiences of Hudson Taylor was suffering. Yeah, hugely. Yeah. And I think that's one of the lessons to learn is his response to suffering. Mm. It, it has so much to teach us. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's chapter eight of my book records this. And I think it's a space of three years where he had the most intense suffering, but also the most intense spiritual experiences, which helped him with that suffering and see them in a renewed light. Mm -hmm. So um, the first tragedy was his eight-year-old daughter, Gracie. Mm -hmm. uh, she died. They were up in the mountains and there were a number of them were sick. Hudson Taylor was sick. His son was sick, he had to perform an operation on his son, but then his daughter, um, eldest daughter Gracie, became very ill and they knew that she was not going to survive. And there's this really sad, um, sad image that I carry, and it, it's written about in the book, where they had to bury her body in like a tin bath under pillows to carry it down to the junk ships to go back to their compound because if they had stayed and the people, the Chinese, where they were staying in the mountain areas, knew that somebody had died, she would have had to have had a Chinese burial. Yeah. And he just said, the Lord upheld me. And you just imagine, how would we cope with that today? But that was his, his eight-year-old um, daughter, Gracie. And then three years later, he lost his five-year-old son, Samuel. His other children went back to Britain to be looked after by Benjamin and Amelia. He was left with one, the youngest child, Charles, who was about two. His wife, Maria, was pregnant with another son. She gave birth, but Noel died within two weeks, yeah. followed shortly after by Maria. Yeah. So suddenly he was left with just a two-year-old child. Yeah. No wife, no children, yeah. and three four bereavements. So this, this I, I said at the beginning that, that our theme was going to be called by God, yeah. um, and uh, that proves it. It's not just a, a, a notion that he had that I'm called by God. No. His life demonstrated it. Absolutely. Uh, and if I could just mention our friend Gillian again, when yeah. she went on the mission field, her husband Roy yes. was, was also murdered. Yeah. Um, and she, and, but she, when I say also, he was murdered by bandits, but she still felt called and carried on yeah. just yeah. with a young a baby yeah. for 16 years on the mission field. And I think what's incredible is when you read the letters that he wrote to his mother, to his sister, to friends at that time, he's no less human in his grief. Yeah. He really felt it. But at the same time, he could still say, but there's joy, mm. there's peace, there's rest, mm. there's joy. Mm. And that's incredible because not many people can say that no. when they've been through that. No. Yeah. Okay, back to Benjamin. Back to the Broom Hall. And, yeah. and we, let's talk a little about the Cambridge Seven. Okay, so Benjamin Broom Hall, he took on the role of secretary to the China in the Mission. He was secretary for about 20 years, and they apparently are called the golden years of the mission. He was very much a background person. He, he didn't push himself forward. He so often, it's the late 19th century, around it's, that time? Yeah, I think. Early 20th? I think he resigned around 1898. Okay, so I've got it. Something backwards. like that. Yeah, good guess. <laughs> I'm not good at remembering yeah, dates. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think Hudson Taylor died in 1905, I believe. So it was it was around that time that okay. Benjamin had to retire. Yeah. Hudson Taylor was becoming ill and sort of handing over. Yeah. So yeah, 20 years he was the the secretary. He did a lot of work in the background training new missionaries, recruiting new missionaries, hosting new missionaries in their house. Um, a lot of the printing was done from England. But one of, his, um, one of the things he's remembered for, I guess, 
is that he had a crucial role in recruiting the Cambridge Seven. Yeah. And there's a little snippet, and we actually found it not long after Dad died, a little snippet that in one of the either the Telegraph or the Times that just records the service of commission mm -hmm. in Cambridge with the presence of Benjamin Broomhall and the Cambridge Seven being yeah. given Chinese Bibles just before they left Amazing. To China. One of whom is very famous, um, C.T. Studd. Yes. Uh, you know, the, who basically, if I remember right, gave his fortune away. So he must yes. have been pretty... Yeah. Benjamin must have had some influence on him. Yeah, and I think the fact that these Cambridge scholars, all of them came from wealthy backgrounds, mm. gave up their wealth because they didn't get treated any differently Everyone was treated the same, whether you were wealthy, whether you were male, whether you were female. The principles of the China Inland Mission were there for you. Mm. And so they had to give up their careers, they gave up their wealth, they took on the dress of the Chinese, just like everybody else did. And I think there's comments that say this did an awful lot in terms of promoting mission in general, not just the CIM, but mission in general as a vocation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just bring, it is a, like another world to where we are today, but if we try and bring it up to where, where we are, you know, this sense of being called, it doesn't seem to be spoken about very much today, and it doesn't seem as though there are many folk who are prepared to give up everything, no. you know, to, to actually serve the Lord, no. whether it's in a home mission or, or abroad. That's right, and I think there's a, a part in the book, um, because the book has at the end of each chapter, reflections on um, a theme to do with spirituality. And in one of them, it does talk about being called and what that means. And I think I've said, you know, for most of us, it's the responsible way of living to make sure you've got money in the bank and your mortgage, etc. Mm. <laughs> and I sometimes say, sort of quite jokingly, if Hudson Taylor were around today, how many people would be saying to him, don't be so stupid, just get yourself a wife and a mortgage and a job yeah. and go to church. You know, yeah. that's enough. But he was very intent on not doing that. And so one of the really strong stories, I think, um, that impacts about Hudson Taylor is before he went to China, he felt, I've got to learn to live dependent on God. Mm. So if I'm going to do that in China, I've got to do it here first. And so he cast himself completely on God. He would give money away, even though the pool was, but I need that. If he felt there was a greater need, he would give it, knowing that God would supply. But we're still human, and we still wobble, don't we? And we still think, is God going to supply? And that's, that's another message that he had to learn himself, was even when he was not as faithful to God as he felt he should be, God would still be faithful to him. Mm. And then when he had the, what Martin Lloyd-Jones calls the extraordinary vision on Brighton Beach, not just to be in China, but to lead this mission and to be the leader. And he had felt this enormous responsibility because it wasn't just about him as a single man going to China. He had a wife, he had a family, and to lead a mission was to lead the lives of so many others. But that, that guidance that he was given on Brighton Beach was a vision not just of what to do, but of God saying to him, but ultimately I'm the responsible one. Mm. Mm. You know, so yes, you've got to be responsible, you've got to be strategic, you've got to be practical, but actually if you're following my will, I'll provide for you. And that's another part of the story is the divine resources that the China in the mission was blessed with in terms of people, in terms of funding, in terms of what, what are called rope holders, the people in the background supplying these resources. Yeah. And the great synergy, I think, of the Christian life that we see when we look back, again, we've talked about how Bunyan and Hudson Taylor are connected. The connections with Hudson Taylor, with C.H. Spurgeon, um, Bernardo, George Muller, wow. you know, wow. these greats that we think about, they're all connected. Yeah, and I o of often think of the legacy in China itself, and I, I don't yes. know whether there is a, a line to Watchman Nee and people like that and the little flock and, and the, the massive, 
you know, chi community mm. of Christians in China today, I would have thought we could trace most of them back to, yes. you know, the, these Somebody China Somebody connected missions. to the mission, yeah. Really messing. And I think towards the end of the mission, of the CIM or to the end of his life story, what was, again, was interesting is that he, he'd gone from, well, let's pray for five workers to 17 workers to 100 workers. And then he got to, right, I'm praying for a thousand. Mm. But they didn't have to work with the CIM. Good. They were a thousand workers that were there in other missions too. Very good, very good, very good. Yes. So we're pretty well out of time. I just okay. uh, recall from my childhood, I read a biography. I don't know whether it was the autobiography, but um, I think it was a biography, uh, at one, probably one that you've mentioned. And I do remember right at the end, Hudson Taylor saying, I've done everything the Lord required of me. It was something as amazing well, as that. Yeah. And you think uh, how many of us could say could that, say that. At, yeah. the end, at the end of yeah. our lives. And he was worn out. Yeah, sure. I think I've sent you through a picture of him on his, the day he died. Yeah. He was only 73. Mm. You look at that picture mm. and he looks 20 years older. Wonderful. You know, but he would call himself, and I think it's, it's good to come back to this, that we're talking about Bunyan and we're talking about Hudson Taylor and they were both amazing people, but ultimately they would want Christ lifted up. And he would say he was simply the little servant of an illustrious master. Mm. Praise the Lord. Thank you yes. so much, Ruth Broomhall. Thank you. Hudson Taylor, called by God. Ruth Broomhall, called by God to be with us here. And I would say also thank you to all of you watching as we uh, have been face to face on the um, lives of James Hudson Taylor, Benjamin Broomhall, John Bunyan, and I look forward to seeing you next time as we go face to face.